In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the new N-Display Config Actor. The Config Actor is now an asset that lives in our project. And we have an example one here. So if we just double click and open up the editor, you can see that we have a nice 3D representation of our stage. This is a, a large volume here made up of various ceiling and walls. Um, this is all an interactive preview. So for example, if I start moving things around, we get a live update, including the meshes themselves. And these are all just 3D meshes that we've created and imported into Unreal Engine and assigned to each viewport. So let's take a quick look at how this all comes together. So over here on the left, we've got all of our components. Uh, primarily, we've got our meshes. And uh, you can see how many individual meshes we've got here. This is all built um, and set up to scale according to the stage. And the middle of the, uh, the origin here of this config actor the simplest way to arrange this is to make sure that this is all relative to the tracking origin of whatever your camera tracking solution is. We've also got some in-camera visual effects cameras here. And as you can see, as we move these around, our Frostum, inner Frostum moves around on, on the preview. But actually we've got two. So this is a multi Frostum setup. And then also for the outer frostum, we have a default viewpoint. And this is very good at controlling your lighting and reflections. On the left here, we have the cluster setup. So this uh, end display cluster, as you can see, is made up of four separate machines or hosts. You can see that each one has a specific IP address set up and it has a window defined. In this case, this is double ultra HD. And within each window, you have these two viewports. And you can see how these relate to specific ceiling meshes we have here. And each one of these viewports has its own resolution set up. So if I flick between, you can see that they've got slightly different resolutions. And then all of this is being visualized in a 2D layout as it would be being rendered on the Windows desktop. And then you would map your LED processors from here accordingly. This is all a very interactive uh, user experience. So if we want to start dragging and resizing things to make them fit, we can do so like so. And, uh, and that includes the actual render window itself. So we can drag this to a size that, that, that works for us. Uh, and it'll actually warn us if we're trying to make viewports that are actually larger than the window. You can also see that there's various other machines in this cluster visualized with their viewports. And this is also real time and interactive. So. If I grab our in-camera visual effects cameras again and start moving them around, you can see that also is updating in this preview. So once you've configured your end display config actor here in the editor, you can compile and save it and actually just drag it into a level. As you can see, we get the real time preview now of the level. And all of those components we were just tweaking are now over here. As you can see, we can move these around and get a real time update. And we could also move this config actor through the space and get an update of how that projection is going to result on the real world LED volume. So that's a very quick look at the new end display config actor. And next we're going to be taking a look at how to create your own. So to create a new end display config actor, you need to right click in the content browser and go to end display and select the end display config. We can choose to copy an existing configuration or we can create a new one. Well, we want to create a new one. So 
select that, hit finish, and let's give it a name, my and display config. And next I want to import some 3D meshes. So I've got these already prepared and I'm just going to import them here. Before we get into looking at the config, I just want to discuss these meshes. So where are they? There we go. So these were created in Maya and uh, I've uh, broken out this particular curved wall and ceiling into three separate meshes. And one of the important things I want to touch upon here is the importance of correct UV mapping. So if we take a look at channel zero, you can see that the UV mapping of, uh, of this mesh, if I go to brush wireframe, you can see that's our mesh there. Uh, it matches from zero to one in the UV space. However, in the second channel, in channel one, as you can see, it's been projected in the aspect ratio of the mesh itself. And actually, if we open up our right-hand wall and we take a look at that same UV channel on the right wall, you'll note that they actually butt up next to each other once they're aligned. Now, the reason for this is so that we can have tracking markers on our chroma key uh, seamlessly map across the two walls and we'll be demonstrating that later in the video. The next important thing to consider is that when we import a mesh we need to just come in here and set the UVs to be full precision so if you just come down to LOD0 and then you can see this use full position UVs if we just tick this apply changes save again do it on this mesh as well, on the left wall, apply changes, save. And this stops us from getting any uh, visual artifacts along the seams of the meshes once they're on the LED wall. So that's that sorted. Uh, so now double click our display config and let's start building this. So here we are. As we're gonna be using curved LED walls, we're gonna be using meshes and not screens. So I'm just gonna delete that. And then the next thing I want to do is drag and drop our meshes in. There we go. We could, of course, have come down here and added a static mesh, but drag and dropping feels good. So here we go. Now, as you can see, that these aren't aligned on the center of, the, of, of this space here, and they're very deliberately in this location. Uh, and not only that, they are also to real world scale. So it's really important when you model these meshes out that you measure and uh, ideally 3D scan your, your LED walls. The next important thing is to make sure that they are positioned as accurately as possible according to their relative position and rotation from your camera tracking origin. So your camera tracking origin is going to be assuming 0, 0, 0 and therefore your mesh is need to be positioned accordingly. And again, having your LED stage 3D scanned and then retopologized into meshes and exported so that they are aligned to the stage origin for your other systems uh, is the best, best method. So that's the meshes uh, discussed and brought in. Let's actually get these set up, those B ports. So down in the cluster section, uh, you can, this is where we're going to list our, our end display cluster. I'm going to set this up across two machines. So let's add uh, a new cluster node. This is node zero. It's going to be ultra HD. And I'm just going to pop in the IP address for this machine. There we go. It's going to be full screen. And uh, that's all we need to do for now. There we go. And that's created a new viewport for us. Now, uh, in the viewport, the type that we're going to want to use is mesh, and then we're going to want to assign it the mesh. So let's, let's assign it the left wall. There we go. Now, it's actually stretching out that uh, mesh across, you know, this viewport across the entire Ultra HD desktop. I know that this LED wall is less pixels than that. So this would be a really inefficient render. We'd be rendering out of Unreal more pixels than we'd be able to display on the wall. So um, 
I'm just going to type in the resolution that I know that this wall is at. There we go. So now you can see how much extra real estate we've got here. Um, let's set up the right hand wall on a, on a separate machine. So add a new cluster node. Again, let's put in the IP address. And uh, let's select Ultra HD, full screen, hit OK. Mesh, right wall, and it's the same resolution, 15.84 by 14.08. Now these are how Endisplay is going to present when it renders on a Windows desktop. And then this is then you know, being picked up by the LED processor and mapped out onto the physical LED walls. Now I happen to know that my LED processor on my right wall is set up to expect that this viewport is actually offset by 15.84 pixels. So, so bear in mind that these values here uh, also allow you to position the meshes as you see fit to uh, whatever your uh, required mappings are for your, for your processors. There we go. So we've got some spare real estate here and I think we can probably fit this ceiling onto one of these other nodes. It's really useful and, and important to think about using up uh, this real estate that you have. So uh, I think we're gonna add that to the first node. So I'm gonna select this uh, node and then add a new viewport. Um, we can actually configure it in here. So if we go to mesh, ceiling, and I know that my ceiling is 1600 by 1280, and then I can hit add, there we go. And I can position this however I see fit. Let's just say that we're gonna put it up next to it, nice and tight like this. So that's how we can uh, get these two nodes set up. Now we could, if we were at home, if we wanted to have this set up on one machine, we could of course actually uh, make this perhaps a bit smaller, fit it under here, and then add a new viewport Let's just do this very quickly for the right hand wall, uh, mesh, right wall, and again I'm going to call it 1584 by 1408, hit add, and as you can see that's just got the entire set of viewports that we require all loaded onto you know one window. And if we wanted to, we could just go and get rid of this uh, cluster node if we want. And this would be an ideal setup for allowing you to pre-visualize your end display uh, from an off-site location on a single monitor perhaps. But that's not what we want to do here. So I'm just going to back up and uh, get back to where we were. So compile and save. Now, we're missing a vital ingredient of an in-camera visual effects stage here, which is of course our, our Frustum camera. So add component and we're going to go down to ICVFX camera. There we go. And here it is. As you can see now, we've got an inner frustum. If we wanted to add multiple frustums, we could of course come in here and add a second one. So here's the second one. And uh, as you can now see, they now uh, coexist in the space. Once they overlap, one of them has to take priority. Um, and uh, that's something that we can manage and I'll be showing you a little bit later on in the video. So just compile and save these guys. So there's lots and lots of settings that we can look at here that are quite relevant. Um, that it will really depend on your stage. Uh, but here's a couple of important considerations I'd like to show you. So first of all is the sync policy. Now, the sync policy is uh, a method which, which we will frame lock and gen lock the output of these two machines so that when our Frustum camera is moving between both walls and we're moving content around, that content is updating exactly the same time across both machines and we don't see any tearing. And there's a couple of methods for doing this. So if we click on our cluster, you can see under render sync policy, we've got type and then we've got a drop down here and we've got ethernet, NVIDIA, none and custom. So let's just talk about these top three. So ethernet is the default and this is basically going to be uh, N-Display's sort of native sync solution. It's going to 
do its best uh, effectively over the ethernet to synchronize the walls, but really to make sure that your synchronized GPU level, you're gonna wanna use a hardware solution like NVIDIA Sync. So that's Sync Policy 2. And there is documentation available specifically for that, which you should study. And there's also some hardware requirements that you would need to adhere to in order to make that work. Sync Policy 0 is no synchronization at all. What that's gonna allow your stage to do, providing you don't have vSync enabled, is let uh, NDisplay run as quickly as possible on every single one of the nodes. And this can be quite useful to see how fast your content can actually run on the stage and what impact synchronization is potentially having over performance. I'm just gonna leave this on ethernet for now. Speaking of performance, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple GPUs, uh, NDisplay supports this, and that's something that we can configure in here as well. A typical use case of multiple GPUs is that we would render the inner frustums on one GPU and the outer frustums uh, on another. And the way we can figure that is that we can actually assign GPUs to these uh, viewports and these in-camera visual effects cameras. So if, let's do the cameras first, and I'm just gonna select those and come down to the configuration window. And here's where we have our GPU index. So by default, it's set to minus one, and that will just use whatever the primary GPU is. But in our case, we want to put them on the second GPU. So I'm going to set that to one. Now, the reason that one is the second GPU is because the primary GPU is, is assigned to zero. So that's that and then to assign these viewports to the first GPU, uh, we actually select the viewports themselves. And then you can see here the GPU index, again by default set to minus one. That's probably okay in this case, but I think for making sure that things are set up correctly, let's just assign them viewport uh, zero. There we go. Hit compile and save. And then the last thing to check, and it's on by default, is that if you go and click on the very top component, you can see that multi-GPU mode is enabled. Just double check that that's the case, uh, but it is by default. And there's uh, multi-GPU set up correctly. There are some other considerations at a Windows NVIDIA driver level, and that is that you need to have SLI enabled and you'll need an NVLink bridge if you're using NVIDIA cards to connect the two cards together so they can share textures, etc. Okay, so uh, one last thing. Um, we also, if we, if we start panning these cameras up, we'll see that uh, they actually, uh, the inner camera frustums appear on the ceiling. Now, that isn't necessarily what we want to do. Uh, for example, if we were shooting up, we wouldn't really want to be capturing any of the ceiling anyway. It's a different type of LED. It's not going to perform the greatest shot. Um, and it actually might start affecting reflections and lighting. So in a case where one of the frustums, for example, might be creeping up slightly, especially if the actual inner frustum is much larger than the camera's frustum, we don't want it to affect lighting. How do we stop that from happening? Well, if we select the viewport, we can actually come over here and we can untick allow in-camera visual effects. Uh, so that's that done. In-camera visual effects all set up correctly. Compile and save. And let's get this into our level. So here we are, and uh, we can now drop our end display config into this level, literally drag and drop. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make it a little bit easier to see. And if actually I drag it back, you can start to see we've got a real time preview of our end display config. And uh, just like we had the components set up in the editor, we can now select these. And as we move these frustums around, you're seeing a real time uh, preview. And likewise, as we move the config around, that's also updating in real time. And this is an excellent tool in pre-visualization to know exactly what you're gonna get on the LED walls and exactly what's gonna be seen in an in-camera frustum before even going near the set. Extremely powerful. The actual end display config actor has a lot of its controls 
in the details panel. We'll be covering uh, these areas in separate videos, but just to know uh, that the controls that you would want to be activating during an end display session over multi-user are all in here. And many of those controls are things that we would have uh, potentially already set up in the uh, config editor, but that you can continue to edit them in here. So one of the key components to consider is how you're actually going to attach your uh, cine camera that's being tracked to these in-camera visual effects cameras. So let's get that set up. For now, I'm just going to create a, uh, a cine camera, drop it into the space. You can now select the in-camera visual effects camera and you can actually assign it the cine camera that you'd like to use. If I just move this second camera out of the way. You can now see that when we select this cine camera and we start moving it around, it's updating the frostum accordingly. And it's this cine camera that would perhaps be receiving uh, camera tracking data over live link. And the same as, as your uh, lens encoded data as well and that will all be respected. So for example, as we change the focal length on the cine camera over live link, so does the inner frostum react. Other important components of the in-camera visual effects setup is the fact that we can very quickly set up a chroma key. So it's actually just in this section down here, we can tick this on. And now we've got an instant uh, green screen available for us that's tracking with the frostum. But more importantly, it's not flooding the entire room with green and we're still actually receiving lots of very useful light from uh, our outer frostum. And you'll also notice that uh, if I go and select the in-camera visual effects camera and uh, you can see we've got these chroma markers enabled and we can control the scale and the tiling of these, as you can see. And these are seamlessly tiling across the two walls and that's thanks to that second UV channel mapping that I discussed with you earlier. So that's why that's important. So another important consideration when setting up your end display config in your level is your hierarchy. In this case we have got our end display config and we've got this tracked cine camera and as you can see, if I start moving this around, this tracked cine camera is, you know, is not moving with the stage, which is, which is incorrect because in real world, this tracked cine camera should always be relative to the, the, uh, the tracking origin of the tracking system, which if you remember in our case was the nodal point, the, the, the origin of our end display config. So in order to get this set up correctly, uh, what we should really be doing is parenting our cine camera to the end display config. And to go one step further, if you wanted to produce a uh, incredibly accurate relationship between the cine camera and the LED walls for, say, a set extension, we should also be doing some nodal calibrations of the camera, lens and the LED walls, um, which we'll be covering in a separate video. In order to uh, prepare for that, uh, you want to also be creating a new actor. Uh, we're going to call it um, tracking origin. And then we're going to pop this underneath the end display config. Uh, and we're going to zero this out. And then we're going to put our cine camera actor underneath that. And it's actually this uh, tracking origin actor here that we're going to be using to uh, produce an offset that uh, defines the very accurate relationship between the cine camera and the LED walls. The next thing to just cover before we finish is the overlapping of the um, in-camera visual effects cameras. So if I actually just produce an overlap, as you can see here, one of them is uh, chroma key and one of them is not, that makes it very easy to see what's going on. And if I grab my end display config and scroll up, and uh, in here we have our, under in-camera visual effects, we have our inner thrust and priority. And this is literally a case of just swapping the order of these, and this changes the priority of the cameras and where they overlap. I mean, ideally 
you're not in a situation where they are overlapping, but that sometimes is not possible to control and therefore um, you're going to want to have discrete control over that. So just change the order here. So that's a uh, quick guide to setting up your own end display config actor.